We are here at the Penderin Distillery in Wales with Giancarlo Bianchi, uh, who is technical director. Did, did I say that correctly? Yeah, that's fine. And he will be showing <laughs> us around the distillery. Thank you for doing that. And yeah, let's start the thing. Fantastic. Yeah, good morning. Welcome everybody to Penderin Distillery. We've got a typically sunny day around us today, which is a typical for Wales. And uh, today we are going to be showing you around um, our distillery. We're going to take a little walk around the corner outside the building where um, there is a, a little mound of uh, grass in the distance there. Yeah. And that's where we have a borehole. It goes about uh, 20 meters underground. And uh, uh, about 20 meters underground, we've got a pump. It sucks water that comes from the Brecon Beacons National Park near the distillery. It sucks it into our distillery and we use it for our production uh, processes. So that's all rainwater that drops? It's mostly the, the rainwater that goes through the ground to the local geology mm. and it fi eventually filters into um, underground uh, crevices and in, under the distillery and, and then it comes into our production. So it's all natural water, uh, naturally filtered, uh, that helps uh, produce our fantastic whiskey. So Giancarlo, this is part of the uh, visitor center here and you have some very nice exhibitions here and I see someone who has been the Prince of Wales. And that's Christ right, that's right. So the visitor center opened back in 2008 and we were really lucky and fortunate to have the support of the Prince of Wales. As you can see on the photos here, he came here in June 2008 to help us open the visitor attraction which uh, in normal pre-pandemic time would welcome 30 to 40,000 visitors. So we got a, a display here of uh, his signature as well when he visited, but also some of our very earliest bottlings. Uh, so this is the very first Pandering bottling back to 2004, very collectible edition. And um, this is part really of the old branding, but part of the history of Pandering. And then uh, on the other side uh, the, of this cabinet, we got uh, a collection of uh, all our distillery bottlings. Uh, all of them are kind of uh, natural colors. We don't add any colors, so we don't chill filter any of our whiskies. And you can see we've got a range of colors depending on the type of maturation. We've got port cask, Madeira wine cask, the bourbon, um, sherry casks, and then all our special editions as well. So this is one of the main tourist attractions here in the region, right? It is. So we are inside the Brecon Beacons National Park, an area of outstanding natural beauty. And uh, we are probably the main attraction in, in the area. And for the more adventurous of you who want to come and see us, you can also go and zip wire just up the road from the distillery to have a, get your heartbeat pounding a little bit faster. So as I mentioned a moment ago, Prince, the Prince of Wales helped us to open the visitor attraction back in 2008. But the first time he came to join us was back in 2004 in Cardiff, when we launched Penderin Whiskey for the first time. On the, the 1st of March 2004, mm. St. David's Day, the National Day of Wales. And um, we had the support then. And um, other images you can see up there tell a little bit about the story of Welsh whisky making uh, before us. So the only distillery that produced single malt whisky before Penderin was also called the Welsh Whisky Company, uh, which is our official name. Um, and they stopped producing in the late 1800s and their business officially was closed down in 1903. And from the date they closed the business to the time we launched our whiskey with the Prince of Wales, it's been just over 100 years before uh, whiskey existed again in Wales. So we are kind of uh, the make, we make the rebirth of a kind of a Welsh whiskey as an industry um, in 2004. And uh, we are at the moment we are still the leading distillery from, uh, from Wales. Uh, about every five, six days, we get a delivery of uh, malted barley, about uh, 28 tons of malted barley. A lorry reverses up here and uh, empties its load inside uh, this container, which unfortunately has got some water that shouldn't be there, but that will be dried off before the next delivery. And uh, the malt then is transferred inside the distillery to this uh, conveyor system across into the to the roof there. And then if you go back inside the distillery, we, we can see the containers where the malt is stored. Mm. We've got the two 19 tons uh, malt bins, which are here on the left. And that's where each delivery is stored. 
And then when we're ready to start uh, one batch of production, we transfer some of the mold from the bottom of the mold bin. It goes through the conveyor belt and uh, into the what we call the weighing hopper. So this uh, weighing hopper has got the uh, load cells. And with those, we're able to weigh exactly 1,500 kilograms of malted barley, which is the size of our distillery setup. Once the 1,500 liters have been weighed, they go through this uh, red uh, mill. It's a, it's a four-roller mill, and the barley drops down the chute into the mill. And uh, I, I, when it comes out, so I can show you this, when it, when it goes in, it's whole barley grains, and when it comes out, it's been broken down in husks, meal, and flour. So the husks are the skins of the barley, the meal is the coarser part of the, of the starch, and the flour is exactly the same as flour, it's very fine. And we want to make sure we get those in um, very exact proportions, about 10% flour, 20% uh, meal, and the husks will make up uh, uh, the rest. Where do you get your barley from? Uh, the barley, all our barley comes from um, the east coast of the UK, it tends to come from England by and large. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, all the, uh, the best areas where to grow barley are on the east coast of the UK, where it is not as, west, as wet as the uh, west coast of the UK. But it's all 100% uh, UK sourced barley. As I said, this is the grease case, which could see, we could see at the bottom. When we're ready to start the process, I don't know at what stage we are here at the moment. Oh, perfect. Um, what we do, we sort of mix um, the grease case. We mix the barley that falls from the grease case with the hot water at 65.3 degrees, I believe. And uh, next to me, I got uh, my colleague, Mike. Am I out? Very knowledgeable operator, and uh, he's going to tell us a bit more about the, the stages of the, of the mashing process. As I said, the first step is uh, combining the grist or the milled barley with water at 65.3 degrees, I believe, yes. or roughly. No, uh, yeah, the first water has just gone in, so yeah, Dan's quite right. It's about 65 and a half degrees waiting for to allow for a slight cooling of the, the grist. Right. Uh, it only takes us about 30 minutes to pump all in. We're only dealing with 1.5 tons. Uh, 500 kilos, 6,000 litres of water goes in, um, and then we have a sort of very brief 10 minute recycle period, and then immediately start sending the words over to the fermenter. So that's very quick indeed, no? Yeah, yeah, it's just a very functional recycle thing. It literally just takes the, the worst of the bits away from the bottom so we don't get the filters too clogged. Perfect. Um, so yeah, over to the fermenter. It starts going over to the fermenter quite gradually. Uh, we don't pump it too fast, too aggressively. But about an hour and 10 minutes after we start filling the fermenter, then we start adding the hotter waters. Um, we add the second water in batches. Um, we start at 78 degrees, and then after 500 liters, we, we up that gradually to 80 degrees, further 500 liters, up to about 83 degrees. And then the rest of the second water will run out to about 83 degrees then. And that's the water that will contribute to the wash. So Giancarlo, what happens next? Yeah, so here we're lucky now, we, we arrived at the beginning of the process. As Mike just explained in a moment, they're going to start adding, um, we're extracting some of the liquid, which we call the wort, uh, which is a very sugar, sugary solution that smells like an Ovaltine, hopefully a product you're sort of familiar with. Yeah. The wort filter through the bottom of the mash tun, and they go through a, a, a heat exchanger and the, the temperature of the water gets, gets reduced to about 20 degrees C. The liquid travels from underneath our feet into pipes, into one of our fermenters. And uh, if you go to a fermenter that's been filled recently, uh, which is the one right in front of us here, fermenter number four, hopefully we're going to see 
a very active fermentation. So when the liquid arrives here, it starts filling the fermenter. And what we do, we add dry yeast to it, and that starts the fermentation. So when the liquid goes in, it's uh, lots of sugar, zero alcohol. Mm -hmm. We start the fermentation, and after about three days, we end up with uh, the wort become wash, which is essentially be unhopped beer. And uh, that wash has got an ABV of about 8%. So this fermentation is already peaked, so it's uh, quietening down a little bit. We've got um, uh, smaller uh, bubbles already, but still quite very active. And all the bubbles are carbon dioxide, which is a byproduct of the fermentation that is coming out of the stills. And uh, if we move on to the next fermenter, which uh, was filled maybe 12 hours later, we should have a more active fermentation here because it's an earlier, it was filled uh, more recently than that one. Yes, it is indeed. So you can see the bubbles are bigger, the form is higher. Yeah. Exactly. So this is very early part of the fermentation. And once again, sorry that we cannot transmit the smell because it's absolutely fabulous. Yeah, I call it, a, it's like a fruit salad. Yeah, <laughs> it is. So how long does it ferment in, in, in here? Yeah, our fermentations last uh, almost three days, ne nearly uh, 72 hours, maybe just a short or 72. It depends a little bit on uh, the phasing or the distillations, but we, we certainly do at least uh, uh, 65, 68 hours, no less than that. And the reason why we want the fermentations to start that long, we could use it after two days, is that uh, on the last, the last 12 to, to, uh, to 24 hours, we get a, what we call a secondary fermentation, right. which is not based on the usage of the yeast, but it's based on a, a bacterial fermentation. And the bacterial fermentation will add additional uh, fruity aromas, which we want to have in our, in our wash. Yeah. And then the next step from here, our ferment, sorry, I should take a step back. We start with 1,500 liters of malted barley. That gives us, uh, at the end of the fermentation, 7,500 liters. And we are now standing in a very good position to see around us that we have uh, three stills in the distillery. We got um, two stills in that direction, uh, the two columns, mm -hmm. and then we got the, the pair of traditional pot stills here on the right. Each one of those wash stills will take 2,500 liters. It means that one of our fermentation can supply all three stills in one in one go. Yeah. So let's go to um, the special Fender in Faraday stills. So this is what uh, this type of steel, the Fender in Faraday steel, is what makes us absolutely unique within the single malt whiskey industry. You will not find this kind of steel anywhere else. It's based on a single copper pot distillation. And uh, above the pot, which you can see, we've got a, a short column with a fractionation plate, which means uh, there are plates with holes where the vapors travel through. And um, at each stage of the voyage of the vapors through the plates, the spirit becomes lighter and cleaner. And uh, as the spirit gets to the top of the first column, it carries on its journey to a, a wide pipe, copper pipe, to the bottom of the second column. And then the vapors carry on the journey to the top of the second column, which is much longer than the, the first one above the still. It's got eight fractionation plates. And uh, all that means in practice is that the spirit has got many, many opportunities of uh, becoming lighter and cleaner. Mm. And that's what makes uh, the new make spirit coming out of Penderin absolutely the purest and cleanest you can find within the single malt whiskey industry. I'm sure some people will argue with that. But the spirit comes out at 90% alcohol by volume on average, which is about uh, 15 to 20% higher than what you get from a traditional double distillation. And essentially, that's what sits at the heart of the Penderin DNA. Yeah. And the style and the character of its whiskies are based on this type of distillation, which gives a smooth, fruity, and a whiskey with a very light mouthfeel. And I think it's also worth mentioning that there's a lot more copper contact. Yes, than and that's part of the... the so this, these pipes are not very big. As you can see, this is about uh, 40, 50 centimeters diameter. Yeah. The other pipe is uh, maybe more like 30 centimeters diameter. All the fractionation plates inside the columns are made of copper as well. And copper contact is absolutely essential to clean the spirit. Uh, the, the contact of the vapors with the copper extracts sulfury aromas, which you don't really want in our new make spirit. And it helps us to further isolate the fruity element of the new make spirit. 
here what you're seeing is um, the distillation process in one of the eight, on one of the 18 fractionation plates in the second column. We see the liquid coming down from the top from the condensers, and uh, which is uh, fighting with these vapors move, moving their way up across the plate through holes. And that's where all the chemistry takes place, where you get exchanges between gas and liquid at, a, at every stage of the process, make the spirit lighter and cleaner and fruitier. We're now on the ground floor by, by the original Fender in Faraday still, which has been operating since September 2000, our oldest still. And uh, we are just next to the spirit safe. So we are at the early stages of the distillation, and this is where the alcohol comes out. And uh, this is the alcohol that's going to be inserted into casks in our maturation warehouse later on. What we're going to do, we're going to take a little sample of the spirit, and we're going to measure its ABV. It's disappeared. What's happened? Let's try again. Okay, so here you can see the ABV at the moment is 91.5%, and that's uh, the highest you'll ever find, I think, within a single malt whiskey industry. The average ABV at the end of the distillation is about 90%, and as I told you earlier on, that's going to have a significant impact into the quality and the type of spirit and whiskey we produce. And to make it clear, that's not really nice to drink. Well, uh, depends on your taste. I would add a little bit of water, that's for sure. <laughs> it's, we can try that later on. So the next stage in the process, after the spirits comes out of the stills, it goes down to a warehouse where we reduce it to cask in strength, which open bearing means about 63.5% ABV. Most of the whiskey will start its maturation journey in a, a type like this one, a Buffalo Trace um, uh, ex-bourbon cask or some other type of bourbon cask. And uh, in these bottles you can see what happens as time passes. The spirit is clear when it goes in the cask. After one year, it gets a bit darker, and it gets darker as time goes on, essentially. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the whiskey starts its life in an ex-bourbon cask. And what you can see around here in front of us, it's different types of casks and different whiskies. And each whiskey it gets its color, its flavors from an additional or separate maturation in different type of cask. So our house style is Pendere Madeira finish. Uh, we have got other expression with the type of a, uh, maturation as well, Pendere Legend. And this is a Madeira cask that comes from Madeira, the island in Portugal. And that's where the richer golden color for the whiskey comes from. The f s s uh, flavors of um, uh, raisins, the sultanas, they all come from, uh, from this type of cask. Uh, how did a Madeira cask become a house style? Yeah, so we, we were very fortunate that very early in the history of the distillery, we managed to uh, start working with Dr. Jim Swan, a master distiller, uh, uh, world renowned. Um, and he, he was the, really the brains behind the, uh, what type of style of whiskey we should be producing with our amazing new made spirit. And he felt that Madeira maturation, Madeira cast maturation, was uh, excellent for uh, achieving uh, and highlighting the, the uh, raisin and sultana flavors you get from those casts for a spirit like ours. And also he thought um, that there aren't many distilleries or any distilleries really that focus on the Madeira maturation as, a, as the house time. So it was a perfect opportunity for us to distinguish ourselves again, to have a really Welsh character in the way we make our, our uh, single malt whiskey. So if you move on, we've got a, this is an ex-Lafroig uh, cask. It's a type of a cask from Isla, which is peated. 
and we use it to do a finishing maturation of the whiskey after it's been in bourbon casks. And that will give the that will give the whiskey a slightly medicinal, slightly peated flavour. And then we've got the, the sherry uh, cask here, Oloroso sherry, and that's used to do a marriage of uh, whiskies, partly matured in Oloroso cask, partly matured in ex-bourbon cask, to create our sherry wood expression. Mm -hmm. And finally, another example, a port cask that comes from near port in Portugal, obviously, and uh, that's contained ruby port cask, a young port, and we use that to do a double maturation for this expression. Uh, half the time in ex bourbon casks and the other half in a, in a uh, port casks. So all these are examples of uh, how we use casks to create a range of different expressions. And uh, in every single case, we make sure that we don't over mature the whiskey in these casks. We try to find that a balance and elegance to the whiskey, which is a trademark of the Pendering whiskey range. So we now we moved out of the distillery, the, the pretty side of the business. Uh, this is with the production side. It might not be as pretty, but this is where the, some of the action, important action takes place. Once the spirit is transported from the distillery, it arrives here to the uh, warehouse. It goes into this dilution vessel and is reduced to cask in strength with water from our borehole at the distillery. And cask in strength for us is 63.5% ABV. Um, and behind, uh, the cameraman, the cameraman, we've got uh, our filling um, apparatus essentially and uh, what we, we bring the casks in from outside mm -hmm. and uh, we automatically fill them and uh, the filling level is recorded automatically on the computer. What we have in front of us is second fill ex bourbon casks. Just which brought is in from outside. Just brought in from outside yes. um, and uh, we uh, fill about uh, in total nearly 3,000 casks a year. Not all of them ex-bourbon, but the vast majority will be ex-bourbon casks to start with. Uh, and this is, I guess, the next stage of the production process. Once we get to this stage, mm. we're going to put them in, our, in, a, in an area which we call the quarantine area, perhaps, where we observe them for a, a certain period of time to make sure they don't leak. And then, then we put them in our maturation warehouse for at very least, at least three years. This no. might be a very nerdy question, but I have to ask. When you dilute uh, the spirit to 63.5, uh, how long does it take? Do you do it at once or do, does it take It is quite a nerdy question. I, I know that some companies maybe do it very slowly. We mm. do it quite uh, uh, reasonably quickly, I believe. Is that correct? And then we homogenize the water with the, with the spirit and uh, we, we transfer it pre pretty promptly into the, into the casks. So we're now in, a, in the maturation warehouse. I'm uh, with our master blender, Aista Phillips. Uh, and uh, these are uh, all, uh, all her children. She got 15,000 of them. That's it's been a very busy a life. <laughs> <laughs> Counting every end of August. Yeah. I see you store them pelletized. That's right, yeah. And not racked. Yeah. There is no reason to do it this way or the other way, really. Uh, I think uh, we pelletizing mainly is first the space mm -hmm. and uh, because uh, we doing a lot of movements as uh, uh, doing transfers it's easier to move the barrels uh, when they are palletized mm -hmm. and uh, on the sides. So most if not all Pender and Whiskey starts its career in bourbon casks right? That's right yeah. Let's maybe talk a little bit about the different cask types you use afterwards then? Uh, that's right uh, we got uh, well as our uh, gold range uh, is saying is uh, Madeira, is our house style. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the sherry, we've got the port, we've got the peated, uh, we've got the SDR cask as a uh, scraped, toasted and recharred. And of course, uh, with all other uh, casks which we're experimenting as uh, rum, tequila, Armagnac, Armagnac, Cognac, uh, Cognac. <laughs> you name it, <laughs> we got a lot of them. So if some of the casks, let's say, feel sick, if it's only a little thing you have to fix, you fix it yourself here in, That's right, yeah. in the distillery. If it's more, then you have to give it to a cooperage. Or? Well, if it's really badly, we can just uh, put on the side and okay. uh, it's go into the garden, garden pots. So there <laughs> are 15,000 casks in here? 
Close to, yes. Close to. And uh, in any particular order, so how do you know which cask is shall we? Shall we take a little walk? Yeah. Or? yeah. <laughs> so well, like on the floor, you, you can see it's uh, marked uh, A1, A3, and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so this block is uh, in my mapping system as a block A. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly all the transfer casks. So we've got the Madeiras, we've got the quarter cask, the rum, uh, port, uh, cherry hops going. So this one is uh, as the closest block and uh, that's where it's uh, at loads of movements going, mm -hmm. constantly changing the places. Uh, after going right to the end, we've got the D block, which it was... Uh, started in 2020 so it's all a new filled uh, cask as for that year and after we got uh, stay close because of the microphone I'm <laughs> trying, I'm <laughs> and i stay close because of the camera <laughs> <laughs> and after we've got the big big b block uh, and it's really mainly it's a bourbons but it's a mixture of everything and it's um, all uh, filled with a new mixed spirit. And um, why is it mixed uh, for the different years? Because we had the warehouse done clinically mm -hmm. and when we were bringing all back, we just put uh, what we were bringing. <laughs> so that's why it's gone mixed up. And after we got the, a new block, which is the C block, uh, and it's uh, all of this year's uh, filled. Right. How would you describe the, clim <coughs> the climate here in, in Wales? Does it help maturation? Does it uh, no. slow it down? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, cold and wet and damp. <laughs> well, that's in the winter, isn't it? It's the winter, yeah. Well, same with a, a global climate uh, changing and mm. uh, warming. Uh, the summer was really hot, so that's that's helped okay. <laughs> quicken up maturation. Obviously, as uh, you know, the, as warmer, it's uh, better for the whiskey to, to mature quicker and get the flavors yeah. quicker. I think it's probably fair to say that it's a little bit uh, warmer. Well, we know it's warmer than Scotland, right. and uh, mm -hmm. we know that also from our maturation losses in Scotland, they tend to be about uh, maybe uh, two two percent, mm -hmm. and we get a bit more than that, two and a half, three percent, okay. which may must have something to do with the the nature of the climate here compared to a few hundred miles further north. So I think uh, what we should do, just in terms of seeing casks, we just go to the far end of the warehouse where there, there are some interesting casks, and also there's a very very precious cask which uh, we don't show to many people. Yeah, so what you're looking at is uh, the very, very first cask that Penderi never filled in uh, September um, 2000. That cask is just over 22 years old, it's still with us, and uh, one day we'll do something with it, but for the moment we just keep it here, nice and cold in the winter and warm in the summer. And um, as you can see, it's surrounded by a range of different casks, um, and on the floor here we've got some very large casks that do not fit on pallets. Um, and I need some help from Eister here, but I believe this is a uh, Tony Paul <coughs> pipe. Sorry, yeah, that's a, a Tony Paul pipe. Uh, that's a, the sherry pipe, and it's an old Dolorosa. They, they uh, mm -hmm. old. Uh, that's a uh, Marone. Uh, what we got? We got the uh, old cream Dolorosa, and uh, very old. We got the Masquetel. We've got another Amarone cask. Um, how okay. how okay. often do you check the cask number one if it's still okay? Um, I think uh, the latest I took the sample, it was last year. And I tend to not bother much uh, in the movement because uh, if we don't need to taste that, mm. just leave it to rest. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've recently been tasting some of the older cars. That, as as I said, she sampled recently for uh, some special projects, which um, we cannot share at the moment, but uh, you'll find out in due course.